and welcome to this evening upstairs at the McCracken County Public Library. I'm Andrew Halford. I am a uh, retired, uh, recovering uh, professor of English from uh, Paducah Community College. Well, let me start Paducah Junior College, Paducah Community College, and West Kentucky Community and Technical College. So I represent all three of those entities to you, uh, as well as contracting work here at the McCracken County Public Library. Just a little announcement if you want to come for a great book discussion. There will be one here next Wednesday. That would be the uh, 2nd of June at noon, and we're discussing uh, uh, a really fascinating book uh, entitled Serena by Ron Rash. Is that right? Isn't that right, Sarah? I think so. So you're, you're welcome to come. This evening we're going to be talking about Irvin S. Cobb, and, and I had a phone call from a Paducah on Tuesday evening late wanting to know essentially what I know about Cobb, and if I'm the Paducah expert on Cobb. Now, I would not call myself an expert. Uh, I have been interested in Cobb for a number of years, uh, going back to the early 1970s when a gentleman, Dr. Wayne Chatterton, from Boise State University in Idaho, sent a blind request to the chair of the English department at Paducah Community College, asking if anyone would be interested in helping him do some research for an upcoming book of Amer uh, the Twain series of American authors. This is the only literary appraisal of Cobb that exists. Now we have some, uh, Anita Lawson from Murray State University uh, did a, a book about Cobb's life, but this is truly the literary appraisal. It's the Twain series of American authors. And he, he came, and we had an absolutely wonderful time interviewing Herbert Wallerstein, uh, Catherine Ingram, uh, Mr. Campbell, who was the only living relative of, of Cobb's at the time. He was one of Cobb's cousins. Uh, so it was just really fascinating to travel. Uh, uh, Tom Waller, who delivered the eulogy at Cobb's uh, memorial service at Oak Grove. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story about Mr. Waller. Um, it was, just, it was just really so fascinating to be able to hear these firsthand accounts of Irvin Cobb in, in Paducah. It was a number of years. In fact, it was 19, um, 1986 when um, uh, Dr. Chatterton's book was finally published. So it was almost 14 years later uh, that that happened. And this is, this is the, first of all, he dedicates the book to Andrew Halford and the people of Paducah for making a Kentuckian out of a Rocky, Rocky Mountaineer. So I thought that was really nice. Um, and he thanks me in his, in his autograph for, um, for the Kentucky hospitality that he received. But I have something here that, that many people find uh, fascinating because my first introduction to Cobb was in uh, 1956, uh, 1957, when my brother, who's a United Methodist minister, was ordained in the, United, uh, in the, in the Methodist Church at Broadway Church here. Um, and the family came and we stayed at the Cobb Hotel and my mother had saved this for all those many years, and for three people, um, it was each night was about eight dollars and sixty cents. Eight dollars and sixty cents one night, and the second night was eight dollars and seventy-five cents. I have no idea what uh, what that difference. So, you know, when Wayne Chatterton came, when Dr. Chatterton came here, I was familiar with the hotel. I'd stayed there. That was also about the time that How the West was being filmed, and. Uh, I was, we were reminiscing about this as uh, we're looking at a, a new publication, and we're talking about how the West was won, and I remember seeing some of those actors at the Cobb Hotel, uh, particularly in the dining room. Of course, I knew, it, so I knew the hotel, I knew the bridge, I knew the golf tournament, I knew the, the street that was named for him. I knew the sign that was on, on the side of Wallerstein's that said that Cobb purchased his first suit there, which is, according to Herbert Wallerstein, true, and, and, and probably was. 
Uh, but I didn't really know anything about the significance of Cobb the writer. So that was one of the things that I really did enjoy about this experience with, uh, with Dr. Chatterton. So again, don't consider me to be the expert. I'm just, I'm just the person who then incorporated Irvin Cobb into the American literature classes that I taught at the community college because I thought if there's not anything else I can do for Cobb, I can at least introduce him to some of the, the students that would be crossing my path. Um, and, and many of those have, have continued to be interested in, uh, in Cobb. I must say that within the last week, I have found some evidence that really disturbs me. It uh, validates what, uh, what I know about Cobb. I want to tell you a little story about Cobb going to New York. Um, Cobb left Paducah at the encouragement of his young wife. Uh, by this time, they had uh, their only child, Elizabeth. And she was from Savannah, Georgia. And she had gone to Ward Belmont College in Nashville. Uh, Minnie Pearl is also, was also a graduate of Ward Belmont. And uh, so Paducah to her was, certainly wasn't anything like Savannah, Georgia, right? I mean, we would not necessarily call this Savannah, uh, the Savannah of Kentucky, although it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, it is, and, and we have beautiful sections of uh, Paducah. Anyway, she, uh, she settled here, and um, Cobb was the sole caretaker of his mother. After his father died when he was about 16, 17 years old, he became the breadwinner for the family. And um, uh, she thought... Uh, that he was probably just too enamored of his mother, that he was too, um, too generous with his, uh, with his help. So she was, she was looking for some bright lights. She liked uh, Canasta. Uh, she liked Champagne. She liked the south of France. She liked New York. Cobb liked I'm, I'm going to try to do this in correct order. He liked Kentucky bourbon, right? He liked poker. He liked, uh, he liked the, the, uh, the uh, kind of the Midwest, uh, kind of the uh, Minnesota, Montana part of, of this country. He, um, I guess that's more West, isn't it, than Midwest? We're, kind of, we're supposedly in the Midwest. And he... Um, uh, he also liked Chicago. He had done some, some reporting for the Chicago Tribune. So, you know, that would have been a natural for him if he were going to leave Paducah to go to Chicago to get a full-time job. But she said, no, my father is going to loan you $200 so that you can get to New York. And um, he goes. He takes that $200. It takes him forever to find a job. Uh, he went in August. Uh, Probably the I, 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 never having been to New York in, in August, uh, very hot. Uh, the time of the year when they're laying off journalists, they're not hiring people. So he says that he wrote his best best piece after he had been to all of the daily and the evening newspapers in New York and and had offered himself um, for hire. He went to a park and he sat down and he wrote this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what he said. This, he says this is his best writing. He says, I'm tired of sitting in the anterooms of every newspaper in New York City and talking to the office boys. I'm tired of that. And the best opportunity you have to hire the best journalist would be Irvin S. Cobb. And he, he sent those out. He went to a stenographer and, and had those typed up, and he sent them out, and he got job offers. So by the time Cobb, by, 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 the, by 1911, Cobb was the highest paid journalist in the United States. Um, so that's, that's his number one reputation. That's his, that's his first reputation. But one of the most exciting things about Cobb, 
when he went to New York was the opportunity to meet Mark Twain. Uh, Cobb had grown up reading Mark Twain. Cobb uh, modeled a lot of his writing after Mark Twain. So this was at the end of Mark Twain's life. And Cobb had the opportunity as a young journalist in New York to do an interview with Cobb, um, with Twain, excuse me, with Twain. So he goes to the hotel, he interviews Twain, he comes out and he's asked, what did you find? Did you see this person you admired the most? And Cobb said, mm, I have to say I have just left um, a visit with one of the most miserable men I have ever known in my life. And we can understand that if you know anything about American literature and Mark Twain, you know that by the time Mark Twain um, was a stand-up, was a sought-after uh, entertainer, he had lost everything. He was bankrupt, uh, family had died, he was, he, was, he was ruined financially. And the only way he could redeem himself was by being the caricature, by being the entertainer. But he was extremely wounded. And this is, this is what really, really kind of distressed me in the last couple of weeks. Because I had always known that toward the end of Cobb's own life, he had become a miserable old man in his 60s. Now, you know, Twain was much older than that. But Cobb, and, and, and you know, Cobb had tried to do so many things in his life, and he was a, a success at everything that he did. I remember, he had to go to work at a very early age to support his family. His maternal grandfather, Dr. Reuben Saunders, was probably one of the foremost doctors in the United States uh, at the time of Cobb's birth in the 1870s. He was one of the first to treat um, the, the using using uh, um, no I'm going to mess this up because um, all I all I all I in my mind right now excuse me is cholera and I know that's not right. Um, using an anesthetic in surgery. So, I mean, he, he, he was very well respected. He, he um, wanted to pass on, particularly to his grandsons, um, great opportunities. So every one of his grandsons was given a full ride uh, to any professional school that they would choose. So, you know, in, in those days it would be medicine, it would be law, it would be uh, as a professor. Uh, but Cobb, because he had to go to work at such an early age to support his mother and his siblings, he didn't have that opportunity. So one of the things that he said to his granddaughter was that his goal in life was to prove that he could be as successful as his cousins. They were the doctors, they were the lawyers, they were the college professors, they were the educators, that he could be as successful. So that, it, his, first, his first success was in journalism. And it started right here in Paducah. Because he, his wife said that he had a photographic memory, that he could, you know, things happened to him. Uh, he had the habit of keeping a little notebook. Uh, so that if he couldn't remember something, he could refer back to that notebook and, and, and refresh, his, uh, refresh his memory. I had said that, I said that he was, um, uh, had done some, uh, some journalistic work for the Chicago Tribune. There's a, a very famous um, escape uh, that, that takes place from Chicago to, to Paducah. Um, these men have committed a murder, they've escaped, they're on the trains, they're coming south. The word is that they probably will be passing through Princeton. One of them is wounded, so someone needs to get to Princeton uh, as quickly as they can and cover this, and Cobb was the person who got to Princeton first. And his coverage was monumental. In fact, it was so long that the telegraph operator 
had to tell him to stop. The Chicago Tribune had to tell him to stop, that it was entirely too much uh, that he was sending. So he had already established himself in, in journalism. He also left here and he went to Louisville and began writing one of his first humor columns entitled Sour Mash. Sour Mash, bourbon. Um, if you read uh, a, a, a recent issue of Kentucky Monthly, you'll see a nice spread. I believe it's in Kentucky Monthly or Garden and Gun, one of those two. Carolyn, is it Kentucky Monthly? Okay, good. Uh, you'll see a nice spread about Kentucky bourbon. And Cobb was, uh, I mean, he, he knew good bourbon. He knew good sour mash bourbon. I think of, I think of the, uh, the, the sisters on the Waltons, you remember them, uh, who made the recipe. Um, and, you know, that, so Cobb understood. Cobb understood good bourbon, so he wrote Sour Mash. It was a humor column. It was very much like what Benjamin Franklin had done under the pseudonym of Silence, Silas, si, si, Silence Do Good. Silence, do good. That's what I said. I, I was trying to say Silas, and well, anyway, silence, do good. Uh, Benjamin Franklin pseudonym. Uh, vignettes about uh, Louisville society, and it's satirical vignettes about you know maybe how how elevated they thought they were when they really weren't. You know how that kind of thing goes. So he'd done that. Th then he left uh, um, Louisville and he went to Cincinnati. He was in Cincinnati when our only governor was uh, assassinated. And when I finally made it to Frankfurt and I saw the old Capitol and the office building and how close all that is and the railroad tracks that run in front of it. How many of you know that about Frankfurt? Um, and the buildings across where the, the assassin would have been hiding, uh, you know, and this was all some of the feuds, uh, the, had, uh, the, had, uh, the McCoys and the Hatfields. Um, anyway, Cobb was there, and he actually saw Goebbels be shot. And he was the first person to reach Goebbels' side. In fact, he was even considered to be a suspect because he was, he was so quick. He got there so quickly. So he wrote, once again, the best coverage of that assassination. It was a first-hand account. So he had already established himself by the time he left here and went to, went to New York. And he proved himself in New York. Again, by 1911, he was the highest-paid journalist in the United States. He was given um, a great banquet at the Waldorf Astoria. Um, Will Rogers was there. Uh, many of his cronies were there. They roasted him. Uh, it, it was a grand evening for, for Irvin Cobb. So he was very successful as a journalist, not just a humorist. Not just a humorist, because you see, we've, I've already given you two examples of serious journalism. One, the coverage of the two escapees from... Uh, Chicago and the other one of the assassination of Goebbels. So he wasn't just the sour mass journalist. He was a very, very serious journalist. So he, he, he established himself in that way. So he's saying to his wife, and she's always kind of the nudge, this Laura Baker is, he says to her, you know, I think I probably could write a really good short story. Now, I've brought some examples of, of Cobb's uh, publishing. Uh, let me go to this one. This is the, this is the better one. He, he, he was published in the Saturday Evening Post and also Cosmopolitan. So by the 1920s, the 1920s and 1930s, Cobb becomes the, one of the most popular uh, writers of slick short fiction. Uh, he was uh, in, the, in the camp with F. Scott Fitzgerald. So anyway, he says, his prelude to all of this is saying to his wife, you know, I think I can, I think I can write a really good short story. Her being the, not, n the nudge, she said, okay, let me see you. Let me see you do it. 
Um, and, and his first short story was Esca The Escape of Mr. Trim. It was uh, a short story based on an actual escape of a convict in New York that he had covered as a journalist. Um, it's, 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 it's probably one of his more serious, uh, serious pieces. So he was beginning now to establish himself as a writer of fiction. Now, you'll see that most of the books that, that Cobb published are really collections of his short stories that he published in Cosmopolitan and the Saturday Evening Post. Now, the, the, the great twist about Cobb, one of the great twists about Cobb is that he, remember, had this photographic memory about Paducah. Uh, he loved the foot of Broadway. Uh, his uh, father worked at the Fowler Crumbaugh boat, boat store that overlooked the Ohio River. Cobb would go down and, and sit on the porch that overlooked the Ohio River and listen to the men, who, many of whom had served in the Civil War, tell their stories. <clears throat> so Cobb already had this ability to listen and to tell stories. And if you know anything about writing, if you know anything about listening, one of, the, one of the key elements is to be able to tell a story and to be able to tell a story that will keep people's interest. So Cobb heard stories about the Civil War. He heard stories about the Ohio River. He heard stories about the American Indians. He heard stories about Paducah in the early days. He also met... Uh, his father's best friend from the Civil War, a man by the name of uh, Shrewsbury. And it was, he, it was this man who did more for Cobb in terms of encouraging him to become a journalist than anybody else. And so he, he learned to, he met people through this self-proclaimed uncle. He met people in Paducah that, you know, he may or may not have met as a, as a young man. But these were people that he kept in touch with um, even after he left here. And one of those was a Judge William Bishop, who's immortalized over here at the Democratic County Courthouse. <clears throat> Judge Bishop was uh, one of those good, solid country lawyers who never lost a race. Uh, who was also himself a really good, uh, good storyteller. Uh, so Cobb decides that one of, the, one of the things that he can do is develop a whole series of short stories around this judge, William Bishop. Uh, certainly he's not going to call this character Judge William Bishop, so he, the, the name he chooses is Judge Billy Priest. You get it? Judge William Bishop and Judge Billy Priest. Got this whole, whole ability to, to deal with, with a flock, deal with, the, deal with the people. I was asked by someone in an email not long ago, and I've got to respond to this particular person. I'm, I'm very famous for not responding to emails in a timely manner. But one you know what one... What one, what one characteristics of Cobb that I would, would choose to, um, to identify him with, and Cobb's ability in what, what I call pen portraits. Um, Cobb was also a cartoonist from a very early age, and he, was, he, he could draw with either hand. He loved this caricature that's probably the most famous of him uh, that is part of the Irving Cobb Hotel. Uh, he, he was not a handsome man. He was not. His wife says that the first time she met him when he got off the train in Paducah, she came here with some girlfriends from Paducah. They were also students at Ward Belmont, and they convinced her to come to Paducah with them one weekend. So they set her up on a blind date with Irvin Cobb. And they get off the train, and Cobb has rented the best Surrey in town, 
with the best horses and a brass band to welcome this Laura Baker Spencer from Savannah, whom he's never met. Well, of course, you know, she and her girlfriends get off the train and, you know, hear this band, this brass band begins to play. And her comment as she was interviewed by the Courier Journal in the 1960s was that he was the ugliest little man she had ever seen in her life. So, I mean, you know, it was not one of those uh, love at first sight blind dates. And I'm sure several of us have been on those kind of blind dates. But she said he had the prettiest little feet of any man she'd ever seen. So he was not a handsome man. He was, he was truly, truly ugly. Uh, but he, 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 was, he was a godsend for caricatures. And he loved these caricatures and probably even drew some of himself. Um, Jane Goodman Sullivan was also one of the people we interviewed in the 1970s. And her father had been the editor of one of the Paducah papers. And, and Cobb, when he came back to Paducah, would always visit the Goodmans. And he would smoke cigars. And, oh, I forgot to say that. He, he also liked to smoke cigars and, and drink whiskey and play poker. Well, he would smoke cigars and drink whiskey and play poker at, at, the, at the Goodman home. And he would, he would pick Jane Goodman up, put her in his lap, and he would draw cartoon characters for her. And she said that the one thing she regretted the most is that she did not save any of those. Would that not be a treasure trove for the McCracken County Public Library in family and local history to have those? Yes, yeah, she said that that was the one thing that she regretted. He was very good at, um, at drawing. Um, and he, again, he was, not, he was not embarrassed by what he sees. One of my favorite short stories by him is entitled Words and Music. And I'm, I'm going to read a little, I'm going to read a pen portrait for you. Now, when I use this word pen portrait, obviously I'm not talking about this kind of portrait. I'm talking about a portrait in words. So this is the Judge Billy Priest, who has gone to probably Union City as a character witness for this man who's been accused of murdering uh, one, uh, the, the circuit court clerk in, um, in that county. And this, this, the, the lawyer is a, a real sl slick gentleman from Indiana by the name of Durham. Very dressed in a cutaway. How many of you know what a cutaway is? Okay, it's, it's, it's an old, it's old tales. You know, they, they were kind of short, just kind of below the posterior. Uh, that, was the, that was the garb worn by teachers, male teachers, preachers, and lawyers. So, but this, this Durham was very slick. He was, he was a young congressman, you know, or future congressman. He was very slick, very knowledgeable, he thought. Well, he, you know, he, since, no, since the only witnesses he could bring were these character witnesses, one of the ones that he invites is this Judge Billy Priest. So let me, let me read just a, a couple of excerpts from Words and Music. Uh, this is, the, and, and this, of course, Cobb, Cobb's description. The third was a judge priest who sat on a circuit bench back in Kentucky. In contrast to his size, which was considerable, this judge, priest, had a voice that was high and whiny. He also had the trick common to many men in politics in his part of the South of being purposely ungrammatical at times. This mannerism led a lot of people into thinking that the judge must be an uneducated man until they heard him charging a jury or reading one of his rulings. The judge had other peculiarities. In conversation, he nearly always called men younger than himself son. He drank a little bit too much sometimes, and nobody had ever beaten him for any office he coveted. Durham didn't know what to make of this old judge. Sometimes he seemed simple-minded to the point of childishness almost. Well, that, that, gives, us, that gives us a little background, but let me... 
let me go now to um, an actual description of the judge priest. Now, we already know that he's, he's large, uh, that he has a voice that's high and, whine, high and whiny. Here is the description of the judge priest when he takes his seat. He wore a black alpaca coat that slanted upon him in deep longitudinal folds, and the front skirts of it were twisted and pulled downward until they dangled in long, wrinkly black teeth. His shapely gray trousers were short for him and fitted his pudgy legs closely. Below them dangled a pair of stout ankles encased in white cotton socks and ending in low quarter black shoes. His shirt was clean but wrinkled countlessly over his front. The gnawed and blackened end of a cane pipe stem stood out of his breast pocket, rising like a frosted weed stalk. Now, can you see this Judge Billy Priest? That's a Cobb pen portrait. That's what Cobb could do. That's what he could centered this character of the judge priest, his most famous character. He wrote, he wrote, in fact, he, he, he starts with, with the judge priest in later life. He's so successful with that, he goes back and covers the judge priest from as early a time as he can recall up to, uh, up to the time where he actually started. This is this is the kind this is the kind of writing that set him that set him apart. People enjoyed reading that. It was entertaining. Plus it gave them a taste of what it was like to live in Paducah. So if we're looking for for a classification of Irvin Cobb's short story writing, his fiction writing, it would be local color. Local color though, you see by that time was not an accepted genre of fiction. Uh, it had been when Mark Twain started writing in, in the last quarter of the, the 19th century. But by the time Cobb starts writing in the late teens, 20s and 30s, local color was just for entertainment. It did not have any redeeming value in terms of a literary genre. It was for entertainment only. But Cobb was the most popular writer of fiction. He was the most popular writing of slick fiction, writer of slick fiction. He never wrote the definitive novel. I um, must admit, I'm, I'm just now in my senior years, yes, I am a senior member of this community, spending time, more time, beginning to read uh, read Cobb, uh, again, seriously. Uh, Red Liquor is one of his novels. It is sour mash. It is kind of like going on the sour mash trail, the bourbon trail of Kentucky at that particular time. So I'm thinking in, in preparation for this evening, you know, I need to start reading this. Now I know why Cobb is not a, was not a writer of the definitive American novel. I mean, this isn't bad, but he's so much better at his short pieces because he can develop this, this character. He can, he can get the writer involved in what he's saying and what, and what his characters are doing. He was not just a writer of local color, though. He was a writer of suspense, of mystery. Some of the, some of the best, darkest pieces in American literature, we can, we can see attributed to Irvin Cobb. Again, not that he's going to be up against Edgar Allan, Edgar Allan Poe. He's not. But he, he, he captures some of the essence of the darkness, not only of western Kentucky, but also of New York. Uh, Incident up a side street is probably one of the most intriguing little pieces that he writes. And it's, it's about... Uh, uh, an incident, a pretty serious incident in, uh, in New York City. Again, he was such a keen observer. He was such a keen observer. And he, 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 again, loved to listen. He loved good stories. 
and he would incorporate all of that into, into actually what he wrote. This is what he said to his granddaughter. His granddaughter was uh, in Paducah several times, uh, and I did have the good fortune of, of interviewing her. Uh, she was delightful. She was uh, married to Mike Wallace at one time. Uh, they were both actors. Uh, she um, uh, went on to uh, um, just essentially be herself. Uh, she, she did love to talk about her grandfather, and she said that the best piece of advice that he have, ever gave her, and this goes back to what I said about his decision, his goal to be the best at what he did so that he would be comparable to his, uh, to his cousins, he said, in order to succeed as a journalist or a writer of fiction, really anything is that you have to apply the you have to apply the seat of your pants to the seat of the chair and just do it just do it and don't and and don't stop apply the seat of your pants to the seat of the chair until you accomplish what you intend to accomplish he also was an entertainer uh, probably one of the most popular t uh, radio programs on the Mutual Broadcasting Network was Paducah Plantation. Uh, a great, great little piece. Uh, you know, just in, in, in the heyday of, uh, of radio. Uh, he, he enjoyed doing that sort of thing. His, his granddaughter, again, said that if he had been alive, if television had been available earlier, he would have been an early Johnny Carson. You know, whether or not that's true, I don't know. He was also a very sought-after after-dinner speaker. Uh, very entertaining. And he, he didn't come into that uh, in later life. He didn't come into that after he became a miserable old man. In fact, what happened to, to Irvin Cobb after he became a miserable old man was that he just kind of disappeared. Um, but, but, you know, he, he, was, he was a serious entertainer. He, like... F. Scott Fitzgerald and William Faulkner journeyed to Hollywood to try his hand at screenwriting. Not one of his best, not one of his best. He was not a good screenwriter and he certainly was not a good actor. Uh, if you've ever seen Steamboat Round the Bend, you would know that. Um, he, he was just, he was not good at it and he realized that. So he, he, he ditched it and, and um, he, he, he moved on. The one thing that I think we as Western Kentuckians need to be proud of, proudest of him is his coverage uh, during the First World War. He was not anxious, um, even though he had been asked several times to go cover the war front in, in Europe. He was not anxious to do it. He refused it. He went twice. He went twice, and one of the things that he committed himself to when he went was to do the best coverage of the war that he could. Now, up until that particular time, the coverage for a journalist would have been done by runners. Uh, they would have had people to go out on, uh, into the front, come back, and tell them what had happened, what they had experienced. So when the journalist wrote, it was all secondhand. Cobb said, if I do it, I've got to go behind German lines. You know, there, were, there was some, some great angst about that. People didn't, you know, they didn't want him to do that. Again, the same reason that he didn't want to go, because he said, I have a, a wife and a young daughter. I don't want to leave them. You know, I don't want, you know, for something to happen to me and, and might not come back. His coverage... What broke the journalistic barriers. So from that point on to this present day, and we can thank Cobb for, which, for what we see on television almost every night. Certainly if you lived during the Vietnam War, that would have been a, uh, one of the first times that, w that we saw the kind of coverage. He set the bar high for wartime journalism. 
And the other thing that he did during the, the First World War is that he, as he, as he was with, really embedded himself in the army, he saw the treatment of African-American soldiers. And he was disgusted with what he saw. He was disgusted by the segregation that, that was prevalent in his United States Army. So one of the things that he decided upon his return was that he, he would go on a campaign starting right here in Paducah at Washington Street Baptist Church. He would go on a campaign to spread the word, to talk about this segregation, these injustices that these young African-American soldiers were experiencing. Glory, glory, hallelujah is one of his best pieces about that. Again, it, it, from, from a presentation, a stand-up that he did, and then he, um, he, put, it, he put it into, uh, into writing. He was very much a humanitarian. He said to his granddaughter, he said, you know, some people might consider, to me, consider me only to be a humorist. And I, you know, I've, I've done quite well as a humorist, both in writing and as an entertainer. But he said, what I want to be remembered most for is a humanitarian. I want to be remembered as a humanitarian. Now, here's another piece about Cobb. He was a liberal. In fact, when I first started doing this, I was told that I needed to be really, really, really very careful about Irvin Cobb because there were going to be all kinds of skeletons that would appear about this man, that he's an atheist, uh, that he had a great deal of angst and, and disregard. Mm, no. I, don't really, I didn't really see that part of Cobb. I didn't. He was not a member of an organized church. Does that make you an atheist? I don't think so. Um, he, he writes his last will and testament, which he sends back to Paducah to be kept safe until his death. And one of the things that he writes about is that he wants the 23rd Psalm recited at his funeral because, as he recalls, that was one of his mother's favorites as she was a member of the First Presbyterian Church. Because it doesn't say anything about sin. It, 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 it's about living. He wanted that recited. He also wanted to have Negro spiritual sung at his funeral. And he wanted someone to give the eulogy. Which is where Tom Waller comes into this. Anyway, so I was told, I was told, be careful, be careful. He was a dark, he was a troubled, he was a troubled man. But everything that I hear about Cobb right here in Paducah, whenever he came back, and he came back here often, he loved the hotel. He had a, 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 a suite. He had a special place in the hotel. Um... People lined up. I mean, people would, would say, you know, Cobb is coming to town. You know, you can see him downtown. You know, you might be able to get out and get a glimpse of him because he moved around. One of my treasured little pieces was given to me several years ago. It's a little schoolmate tablet with Shirley Temple on it. This, this friend of mine gave it to me. And it was given to her, well, it was hers, and her father had sent her and one of her girlfriends to downtown Paducah because Cobb was in town. So they're there when Cobb comes in, I think, into a, into a five-and-dime five uh, store. Um, he comes in, and she gives him this little... Shirley Temple book and he signs it and so she, she gives it to me and she says that in the note that she, she wrote 
to go along with this. She says that he comes in um, into the drugstore. I saw only two people occupying a table near the soda fountain. One of the men was the most weird-looking person that I had ever seen. The first vision that came to my mind was a gigantic frog dressed in a natty suit and hat. Surely this wasn't the noted writer. We approached the table, and he gruffly asked what we wanted. I nervously handed him the little notepad with the Shirley Temple cover. He took it and almost grinned at the mustache face on the front. You know, you know how we used to do that to folks. The autograph was the sole entry in the book. The paper is yellowed with 70 years aging and my penciled explanation almost ex in indistinct. But the pinned autograph is a unique signature of an outstanding native son. Listen, remember, she says that the first vision that came to my mind was a gigantic frog <laughs> dressed in a natty suit and a coat. But everybody wanted to see him. It was a treat to see Irvin Cobb. You know, one of the best pictures that we have in the McCracken County Public Library is Cobb standing in front of the old Carnegie Library. Cobb loved this community. He, lo he never forgot Paducah. He said, you know, where's another Paducah? Where's another Paducah? Yeah. Texas! Cobb says that there never will be but one Paducah. There never will be but one Paducah, and that's right here. He would be a marvel for the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, he loved this place. He loved this place. He loved to come back here. Now, Tom Waller, let me tell you about Tom Waller. Tom Waller didn't know Cobb. So when they come to him and they ask him, you know, they ask him to deliver the eulogy, he said, what am I going to say? I never met the man. I don't, I don't know anything about him. And the comment to Tom Waller, how many, how many of you remember Tom Waller? Okay. You know that Tom Waller also was a good storyteller, wasn't he? Yes, he also was the kind of lawyer that you could go to and have a, a, a great conversation with. You know, he wasn't one of these legalistic lawyers. He was one of the mainstays of Paducah Junior College. I mean, this man also was very committed to, 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 his, to his community. So, the person asking Waller to deliver the eulogy says exactly what I just said. He said, Mr. Waller. You also are a good storyteller. So I think we can be assured that you're going to do a good eulogy because you'll find out enough about Cobb that when you stand up and give the eulogy, you'll make it interesting. So at Oak Grove Cemetery, Tom Waller stands. Swing Low Sweet Chariot has just been sung by the African American Choir. And, and Tom Waller delivers a short but an eloquent eulogy. I wish, I wish we had a copy. We don't have a copy, do we, Matt? No, but we may. Mr. Yeager and Mr. Nathan Lynn, they're the mainstays of the, uh, of the local and family history. So, so, so Cobb, had, Cobb, had that, Cobb had that reputation. Here, here's the thing. Cobb was a liberal. That's where I was going when I got off, on this, got off on all of this. Cobb was a liberal. He was a Democrat. Up until Roosevelt was running for his third term, he said he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Who ran against Roosevelt in that election? Wendell Wilkie, yes. Cobb defected. Now, this, this appraisal of Cobb that I read recently that, that was talking about Cobb becoming the, the miserable person 
in later life, not referencing um, uh, Mark Twain at all. Uh, he talks about the, the fact that Cobb had a, almost a complete reversal at the end of his life, that he became a segregationist. He, uh, you know, left the Democratic Party for the Republican Party in terms of support, that it was just a, a complete switch for Cobb. Well, I don't think, I don't, yes, I understand that, and yes, I think that's probably very true, but I think that Cobb was, by that time, experiencing some, some real difficulties physically in, in his own life. He died of the dropsy. The dropsy. Doesn't sound too dadgum serious, does it? <laughs> what is the dropsy? Congestive, Congestive heart, failure. heart failure. So it is serious. The dropsy is serious. Isn't it nice how we kind of sugarcoated things and continue to sugarcoat things? Cobb, Cobb was truly a humanitarian. He, he was truly concerned about what was best for, for everyone. You know, when you, read, when you read his short stories that have anything, black and white is another one of my favorite ones. When you read that short story, it's about the 8th of August. And it's, it's written as Mark Twain wrote many of his pieces in the language of the 19th early 20th century. But it was true. Uh, but it, it showed the caring of the African American community with, uh, with a white community, with a Caucasian. The, the, the interplay, the interplay was really very important that it didn't make any difference. Black and white didn't make any difference. It was about the unity in this particular case on the 8th of August with Civil War veterans. Didn't make any difference which side you fought on at that particular point. You know, we all, we all can, can understand that. Um, do you have questions you want to ask me? When did he die? He died in 1944. Um, died in March and was buried here. His ashes were brought back in October. Uh, well, I, I think this particular, this particular appraisal said that he was a failure in, in Hollywood, uh, that he was not a good actor, that he was not a good screenwriter. Mm, I don't think Cobb would have, you know, I, no. Yes. Right, right, right. And, 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 and that may be one of the reasons for his comment. I don't know when he made the comment to his, to his granddaughter um, because <clears throat> his daughter and her two children, they lived wherever, they, wherever Cobb and, and his wife lived, they lived there too. Um, so, you know, it could have been toward the end of his life that, that he told her that. Uh, you know, it was, not, it was not a good experience for him in Hollywood. I mean, he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't make it, uh, whereas Fitzgerald and, and Faulkner both did. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting thing about William Faulkner, and, and I do have proof of this. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite little pieces about Cobb. Remember, Cobb was the most popular, the most sought-after writer of slick fiction published in, in magazines. So this would have been entertainment fiction, remember. He was the most popular. He was the most widely read in the 1920s and the 1930s. William Faulkner was familiar with Cobb. He read Cobb. Now, you know, we can't, we can't stretch this. We can't make this into some... We can't put a sign in Paducah that says William Faulkner based uh, some of his characters um, after, after Irvin Cobb's characters. No, we can't really say that. 
but we can say that they both shared an appreciation for dialect. They both shared an appreciated appreciation for the characters that they created, the interplay, particularly the relationship between the races. They, they, uh, they both appreciated that. So, so Faulkner would have been very familiar. It is documented that he was familiar with Cobb as a, as a writer. So that there is that little influence, but it's not something that we can publicize with a Chamber of Commerce.